When does one decade end and another begin? There is an argument that the 60s ended in 1970 and the new decade began in 1971. While I have a great deal of sympathy for this view, I've taken artistic licence to begin this series on the damned 70s in 1970 and end it in 1979. The European Cup final defeat of the 6th of May 1970 has to be included. It was a hammer blow from which Jock Steen's Celtic arguably never recovered and which continues to haunt the Celtic imagination to the present day. This series will cover 10 tumultuous seasons in the history of Celtic and provide snapshots of 10 moments in time which chart their decline from giants of the European game to continental mediocrity and their downfall from the top of Scottish football under Jock Steen by 1978 to the green shoots of recovery under Billy McNeil and the emotional roller coaster of 10 men winning the league in May 1979. Celtic never again regained the European standing they enjoyed under Steen, but maybe that owed more to the genius of Steen rather than the natural position of a club from the footballing backwater that Scotland has become. Shakespearean tragic heroes typically have admirable and heroic qualities that gain them the sympathy of the audience, but are brought down by an often single character flaw and their own mistakes. If the Bard had ever turned to Scottish football for inspiration for one of his tragedies, he might well have based it on Jock Steen and Celtic over the course of the 1970s. The story of Celtic in the 1970s is really the story of Jock Steen, and how his carefully laid plans were scattered to the winds by a multitude of problems outside of his control, and, like a flawed Shakespearean tragic hero, maybe some that he could have handled better. By any objective measure, the 70s was one of the most successful decades in Celtic's history. Seven league championships were claimed in that period, as well as six Scottish Cups and one League Cup. On the European front, they began the decade contesting a European Cup final and reached two more semi-finals by 1974. But the trophy hall does not tell the whole story. Steen had already built one European Cup winning team and even as Billy McNeil held the trophy aloft in Lisbon, he had overseen the recruitment of a youthful reserve side that was bursting with so much potential it promised to keep them at the top of European football well into the 1970s. By the end of that decade, his project was in tatters, ruined by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as one by one, the shining stars of the Quality Street Gang slipped through the manager's fingers. Steen himself was involved in a near-fatal car crash in July 1975, after which, by most accounts, he was never the same. Steen would resign in May 1978, with the club now European also-rans, and was replaced by his former captain, Billy McNeil. 
From the most unpromising of positions that season, they would end a cruel decade on a high, regaining the league championship from Rangers when 10 men won the league on an unforgettable night in May 1979. Celtic entered the new decade on the crest of a wave. Reigning Scottish champions and heading for a fifth consecutive league title, they had won the treble in season 1968-69 and had already secured the Scottish League Cup for a record fifth year in a row. At the close of play in the match against Rangers at Celtic Park on the 3rd of January 1970, a 0-0 draw left them two points ahead of the Ibrox club and firm favourites to retain the title. The Rangers title challenge would fall away dramatically in the following months and after Celtic's 3-1 win on a mud bath of a pitch at Celtic Park knocked the Ibrox club out of the Scottish Cup on the 21st of February 1970, few would have bet against Celtic gaining a then unprecedented second treble in a row. The prospect of another treble though did little to stir the blood of a Celtic support whose horizons had been irreversibly widened by their glorious European Cup triumph in Lisbon in 1967. Even the previous season's treble had come tinged with the disappointment of an agonisingly narrow European Cup exit to AC Milan, 1-0 winners at Celtic Park in the quarter-finals of March 1969 after a scoreless draw in the San Siro first leg and who had then gone on to knock out Manchester United in the semi-finals and take the trophy with a convincing 4-1 win over Ajax in the final. Another European Cup was the goal of everyone at Celtic Park and a year after their defeat to Milan, Celtic were back in Italy for the quarter-finals again, this time having secured a 3-0 win over Fiorentina in the first leg at Celtic Park. The Celtic team that took to the pitch at the Stadio Comunale in Florence on the 18th of March 1970 bore the unmistakable marks of Jock Steen's painstaking succession planning as the new decade began and the precocious youngsters of the Quality Street Gang began to press their claims for starting places in the side. 21-year-old George Connolly had burst onto the scene with an astonishingly assured goal-scoring performance in the 1969 Scottish Cup final the year before, a 4-0 drumming of Rangers, but his appearances had been fleeting since then. His display against Fiorentina saw him become an ever-present for the rest of the season. The real breakthrough star of the campaign was Connolly's closest friend, 22-year-old Davy Hay, who had replaced the injured Jim Craig at right back at the beginning of the season and had quickly made himself irreplaceable, his boundlessly energetic overlapping runs and ferocious tackling winning him the first of 27 Scotland caps exactly one month later. Also in Florence that night as keen observers were Lou Macari and Vic Davidson, both free scoring forwards in the reserves who were banging on the first team door and expected to soon kick it open. The future looked bright for Celtic, with these hugely promising youngsters being added to a team that still included the core of the Lisbon Lions. Tommy Gamble, Bobby Murdoch, Billy McNeil, Jimmy Johnston, Willie Wallace and Bobby Lennox still at the peak of their powers. To add to these, Steen could call on squad members from Lisbon and Jim Brogan and John Hughes who were now fixtures in the first team and more recent additions like Tom Callahan and Harry Hood. They would lose 1-0 in Florence but never looked like losing control of the tie and their 3-1 aggregate victory made them the first British team to defeat an Italian club over two legs in European competition. As the month of April approached, Celtic were in the semi-finals of the European Cup and only one team seemed to stand in the way of a second triumph in the tournament and another clean sweep of the honours both European and domestic. Don Revy's fearsome Leeds United, widely considered the most formidable team in England. In the Glasgow Herald of the 20th of March 1970, a report by Jim Parkinson filed the day before from Rome almost casually gave away a confidence bordering on arrogance at Celtic over their European Cup prospects. Celtic will begin the greatest club sale of tickets, 134,000, on Sunday for their European Cup semi-final match at Hampden Park, although their opponents and match dates will not be decided until the draw here tomorrow morning. An emergency plan went into operation today before the jubilant Parkhead players and officials returned home from Florence amid a new wave of prestige for having qualified 3-1 on aggregate against the Italian champions Fiorentina. 
Celtic revealed their remarkable confidence in having the semi-final tickets printed more than 10 days ago and reserving a chartered aircraft if required. The tickets merely state that the match is against opponents still to be decided on either April the 1st or April 15th. While it's often thought that the semi-final tie against Leeds United was moved to Hamden to accommodate the huge crowd expected, in actual fact, it would have been played at Hamden regardless of the opposition due to work being carried out on the roof of the East Terracing at Celtic Park and the tickets were printed 10 days before qualification for that stage had even been secured. The European Cup semi-final victory over Leeds United in April 1970 was one of the highest points in Celtic's history, probably the highest after winning the tournament in 1967, but it was also the worst possible thing that could have happened. The hype surrounding the ties reached unbelievable levels and whichever team emerged victorious from the other semi-final between Feyenoord and Legia Warsaw were regarded as little more than sacrificial lambs to the slaughter in the final. In a report in the Glasgow Herald of the 21st of March 1970, Jim Parkinson wrote, The gasping reaction of the assembly of football officials from almost every country on the continent to the semi-final draw echoed recognition of the stature of the pairing, which both clubs had hoped would be avoided until the final. This hope has gone now, but the neutrals regard the forthcoming encounter as being totally decisive in the tournament, with the final in Milan on May the 6th becoming nothing more than a formality for the winner. Lest anyone should think this was an exclusively Scottish view of Celtic standing, Geoffrey Green in the Times that same day reported, When Leeds and Celtic were paired in the European Cup, groans of disappointment all over the Roman chamber greeted the announcement. Certainly, it was the last thing wanted both north and south of the River Tweed, as everybody had hoped that these two would fashion the first all-British climax. As it is, both clubs can now consider this as their real final, though that, of course, will be of small consolation to the loser. The key to Celtic's decisive victories in both ties lay in the three-man midfield of Bobby Murdoch, George Connolly and Bertie Auld. Murdoch and Auld had been instrumental in the European Cup triumph in Lisbon three years before and were well respected by English observers, particularly Auld, who had spent five years in the first division with Birmingham City. Connolly, though, was an unknown quantity and had played so few first-team games to that point, Don Revy, even with his famously obsessive attention to detail and infamously exhaustive dossiers on Leeds opposition, could not even be sure if he would play in midfield or defence in the first leg at Elland Road on the 1st of April 1970. It must have been with a sense of shock and alarm then that he watched Connolly stride forward in the first minute to plant the opener past Gary Sprake in the Leeds goal. Geoffrey Green described Connolly in his match report in the Times of the 2nd of April 1970 as a fine young player of cool balance and control. The youngster was substituted late in the match and Green reported, with 10 minutes left, Celtic smoothing the ball around, changing the angles, slowing the pace and altering the rhythm brought on Hughes, the strong running express engine as a tactical substitute for the stylish Connolly who had more than played his part in helping Murdoch and Auld in midfield to set up the play for the elusive little Johnston. Connolly had been robbed of an even more impressive contribution when he saw a second goal mysteriously disallowed in the first minute of the second half, but he was back in the 11 who lined up in the return at Hamden on the 15th of April 1970, and this time John Hughes joined him in the starting lineup, a replacement for the injured Willie Wallace. Celtic's monumental victory over Leeds at Hamden saw their confidence for the final reach stratospheric levels. Again, the midfield of Murdoch, Connolly and Auld were the foundation of their success, although most of the eye-catching work, as at Elland Road, had been done by Jimmy Johnston. Geoffrey Green in the Times of the 16th of April also picked out the rampaging hay for praise. The heart of Celtic's brilliant performance lay in the right-wing quartet. Johnston's brilliant, close and elusive dribbling that from beginning to end had slowly sapped Leeds' strength, the overlapping and penetration of hay from fullback and the central prompting of Murdoch and the tall, stately and beautifully balanced Connolly.
When they won the European Cup in 1967, Celtic had employed a 4-2-4 formation inspired by the brilliant Hungarian team of the 1950s of which Jock Steen was a great admirer. But a lesson should have been learned from the emphatic nature of their victory over a formidable Leeds team built around the midfield two of Billy Bremner and John Giles, utilising that three-man midfield of Murdoch, Ald and Connolly. In the final against Feyenoord, Jock Steen reverted to that 4-2-4 formation, dropping George Connolly to the bench, and Feyenoord's three-man midfield of Jansen, Van Hannigan and Hassel did to Murdoch and Ald what they and Connolly had done to Bremner and Giles. Several members of the Celtic team that played in Milan have since identified this decision as a crucial mistake and it seems an incredible error on the part of a master tactician like Steen. Tommy Gemmell, in his biography Lionheart, written with Graham McCall, remembered The team that lined up for the final was not quite the right one. Changes had been made that we thought shouldn't have been. George Connolly had played in midfield in the semi-final against Leeds United when we had been 4-3-3 and clamped down hard on Leeds' much-vaunted midfield, but he was made a substitute for the final, leaving only Bertie Auld and Bobby Murdoch in midfield in a 4-2-4. Feyenoord, though, were 4-3-3 for the final, so they had an extra man in midfield, and that may have allowed them more control over the match. Why Jock Steen made that decision will probably always remain a matter of conjecture. Billy McNeil suggested in his biography Hail Caesar that sentiment played a part. Jock had left out several of the younger players, notably George Connolly, who was on the bench, in the belief that they would have other chances to play in a European Cup final, whereas it would almost certainly be the last for the majority of us. On reflection, there was maybe a wee touch of arrogance about us. While Steen was not noted for his sentimentality in team selection, there is a possibility that this did indeed impact on his thinking. One thing Steen was noted for was his ability to coax a performance out of players by whatever means necessary. Famously, with Celtic struggling at 1-1 in a European Cup tie against Red Star Belgrade in 1968, he had promised Jimmy Johnston at half-time that he would not have to fly to Yugoslavia for the return leg if Celtic won by four goals. Johnston, who was terrified every time he stepped on a plane, responded with an astonishing second-half performance, during which he scored two goals and created another two as they swept to a 5-1 win. He left the field crying with relief that he would not have to fly to Belgrade, and despite Steen's pleas that he agreed to travel anyway, stuck to his guns and the manager stuck by his side of the bargain. On the Saturday before the second leg against Leeds, Celtic lost the Scottish Cup final in a shock 3-1 loss to Aberdeen, overshadowed by some baffling decisions by the notorious R.H. Davidson Airdrie, which all went against them. It was reported on the Monday morning that Billy McNeil had suffered an ankle injury during the final that threatened to keep him out of the Leeds return, and he received intensive treatment until the day of the match. But one other injury remained a closely guarded secret. Willie Wallace was definitely out. Steen now had to decide on a replacement and turned to John Hughes, who over the years had transitioned from a centre forward to an outside left. Before the match, Steen made another promise to a player that he would keep. Archie McPherson writes in Jock Steen, the definitive biography, Before the game started, he singled out one of his players for a special word. John Hughes was taken aside and told, I know you were sick about missing the last final, but if you do well for me tonight and we reach the final, you'll definitely play. There was probably no need to make this promise. John Hughes was a famously unpredictable player who struggled for consistency throughout his career, but at his best, he was a devastating attacker and earlier in the season had been selected by Alf Ramsey in a rest of the UK 11 to play Wales in a high-profile match to celebrate the investiture of Prince Charles as Prince of Wales. Leeds' defence was built around England World Cup winning centre-half Jackie Charlton and Steen remembered Hughes giving him a roasting in a league international a few years before. Having been ruled out in Lisbon in 1967 because of an ankle injury, Hughes was desperate for another chance to play in a European Cup final and needed no motivation on the night. But Steen was aware of his frustration at having missed out in the 1967 triumph and used that to the full. 
Hughes's pace, power and quick footwork tormented the Leeds defence and he scored the goal that put Celtic 2-1 ahead on aggregate early in the second half, diving in front of Charlton to head flick a low Bertie Old cross in at the far post. Is it possible that Steen went for a 4-2-4 formation in order to keep his promise to Hughes, who had more than kept up his side of the bargain? A 4-3-3 formation would have meant one of Willie Wallace or Bobby Lennox missing out to accommodate Hughes, but it would seem out of character for Steen to avoid making a difficult decision. It's too simplistic to say that the formation was the reason for Celtic's defeat in Milan, but it was a huge contributory factor. Another important consideration is the earlier than usual finish to that season, which also contributed to the Leeds fixture pile-up. Before the start of the season, in both England and Scotland, it had been agreed that all fixtures would be completed by mid-April to aid preparations for the World Cup in Mexico that summer, for which Scotland failed to qualify in the end. Celtic secured a fifth successive league championship with a 0-0 draw against Hearts at Tynecastle on the 28th of March 1970, the weekend before the first leg against Leeds at Elland Road. Between the two semi-final ties, their domestic season effectively ended on the 11th of April with the Scottish Cup final loss to Aberdeen. Following the Leeds semi-final at Hamden, they played their final league match against St Mirren at Love Street on the 18th of April, leaving Celtic with no meaningful matches to play in the two and a half weeks before the European Cup final. It was hardly an ideal situation and Billy McNeil remembered in Hail Caesar. Our preparations involved games against Stenhouse Muir, Fraserburgh and Gateshead. Feyenoord, meanwhile, were still involved in competitive action. Simply put, Celtic's season had wound down by the time the European Cup final came along while Feyenoord were still running on adrenaline from their own league campaign. The players were too relaxed and the build-up created that sense of relaxation. Ten days after the final league match at Love Street, a Celtic eleven of Williams, Craig, Hay, Murdoch, McNeil, Brogan, Johnston, Lennox, Wallace, Alden Hughes played against Fraserburgh on a narrow, bumpy, windswept pitch in the northeast in the process, raising £2,000 for the Fraserburgh Lifeboat Disaster Fund. Tommy Callahan, Harry Hood and Steve Chalmers came on as second-half substitutes as Celtic recorded a 7-0 win in front of only 6,500 fans. Three days later, on the 1st of May 1970, in front of only 5,500 fans, they beat 2nd Division Stenhouse Muir 8-0 in a friendly at Celtic Park. The team this time was Williams, Craig, Gemmell, Murdoch, McNeil, Brogan, Johnston, Lennox, Wallace, Auld, Hughes. John Fallon, Lou McCary and George Connolly were the substitutes used, with Davy Hay remaining on the bench. These low-key outings were all part of the plan, according to the Scottish press, with Jim Parkinson reporting in the Glasgow Herald of the 2nd of May 1970. The second phase of Celtic's European Cup final preparation against Stenhouse Muir at Parkhead last night proceeded at a casual pace, but the Celtic scoring machine continued to operate smoothly. Having beaten Fraserburgh, the Highland League club, 7-0 on Tuesday, they boosted their goals total for the week to 15. This was exactly what Mr Jock Steen, the manager, had set out to achieve in arranging the matches. He made no secret of the fact that he wanted a glut of goals to give his players even more confidence. It must be acknowledged that smashing 15 goals past part-time opponents was hardly the best preparation for a European Cup final at the San Siro Stadium against the team that had eliminated the defending champions AC Milan at the quarter-final stage. The relaxed nature of Celtic's preparation was not helped by their hotel accommodation once they arrived in Italy. A complex in Varese, 30 miles outside Milan, where the players prepared in seclusion, completely isolated from the excitement and building tension in Milan as the fans of both teams began to arrive and the city prepared itself in the days before kick-off. Gerald McNee writes in The Story of Celtic, published in 1978 while Jock Steen was still manager. Celtic's build-up to the final with Feyenoord can be conservatively described as casual. Training was kept to a minimum, 
and the preparation bore no resemblance to those before the Lisbon match of 1967. A decision was taken to play matches at Fraserburgh and Stenhouse Muir. As one director was to say after Milan, what were Celtic doing in such places before a European Cup final? They went straight from those games to their country retreat in Varese, some 25 miles north of Milan, a place more suited to Trappist monks than footballers. Unlike Lisbon, it meant that the fans could not see the players because of its isolation. The players, therefore, never really got the feeling that they were there for a European Cup final. The place lacked atmosphere and they had little to occupy their time. Unfortunately, a business agent, appointed after the Leeds matches, was allowed to hold meetings with them in the days before the game when they discussed plans for a big financial killing and what they regarded as a certain victory. They had committed the cardinal error of counting chickens before the eggs had hatched. It was an ill-timed situation and had their loyal fans known what was going on in that mountain retreat, many would not have travelled. The supporters were making great sacrifices and treating the occasion with the respect it deserved, while some of the players were showing as much interest in the financial rewards of victory as in the game itself. That dreadful Scottish trait, which gives us such a conceit of ourselves when things are going well, seemed to permeate the entire club to the extent that an open-top bus had been ordered to meet the team on its return to Glasgow. That had never been the Celtic way. In Lisbon, the players had been constantly warned to keep out of the sun and even to keep away from their bedroom windows. In Varese, they walked about stripped to the waist. Celtic had been completely wound down by the day of the match and it was far too late by then to wind them back up again. The issue of the business agent was a controversial one at the time but it's only fair to say that in the years since, many of the players involved have disputed the suggestion that they were planning a financial windfall before the match and denied making any money from the final at all. Billy McNeil writes in Hail Caesar, In the wake of our defeat, I heard ridiculous stories about how we had only been interested in the financial rewards to be gained from reaching the final and that our attitude had contributed to our downfall. According to the rumour mongers, the Celtic players had not been able to agree a share out of the cash and we had allegedly squabbled amongst ourselves right up to the kick-off. The only flaw in that particular theory was that there had been no cash to share out. By my calculations, 1% of nothing is zero, but I could understand how such a rumour had arisen in the first place. For reasons best known to himself, Jock astonished us by employing the services of a Glasgow journalist, Ian Peebles, to act as an agent on the squad's behalf. I'm sure that Jock was well-intentioned, but be assured, we got bugger all out of the deal and it still rankles with me that some people continue to labour under the misapprehension that the players made bundles of cash. Perhaps the most damning and accurate accusation levelled at both Steen and his players is that Feyenoord had been hopelessly underestimated. McNee writes of Steen's only scouting mission before the final. He travelled to Amsterdam following the semi-finals to weigh up Feyenoord, a job at which he had always excelled. Unfortunately for Steen, the match was played in the Ajax Stadium, which holds only 25,000 spectators and is not unlike Schofield in appearance. Ajax, who had reached the European Cup final the previous year, played their European ties at the large Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam. Feyenoord, on the other hand, were a rich club and had a 65,000 capacity stadium in Rotterdam. Seated in that insignificant Ajax ground, Steen watched an end-of-season match finish in a 3-3 draw. The atmosphere was distinctly small-time and the standard of play pedantic and uninteresting. He could not have chosen a worse match or setting for his vital mission. As a result, he returned in confident mood and on his return to Glasgow left people close to the club in no doubt that the final was past the post. The confidence spread among the directors and players and the general feeling was that the final had been won against Leeds. To say that Celtic underestimated Feyenoord would be a gross understatement and painful as it is to say, Jock Steen must be held most responsible for this state of affairs. His preparation for the match reflected his dismissive attitude towards Feyenoord and left the Celtic players not only thinking they only had to turn up to lift the trophy, but in for the shock of their lives when they got up close to opponents who were supposed to be no-hopers. 
Bertie Auld remembered in his biography, A Boy Called Bertie, written with Alex Gordon. Our boss, so immaculate and impeccable when talking about our opponents, dissecting their strategies and exploring their strengths and weaknesses, didn't look overly concerned as he chatted about the calibre of our opponents. Fayanoord? We could have been talking about Forfa. Three years earlier in Lisbon, we could have told you what the Inter Milan players had for their breakfast we were so well prepared. This was different though. Jock went as far as dismissing some of their team. The big guy on the left-hand side of their midfield won't last the pace, he informed us. He was talking about Wim van Hannigan, who would go on to play in over a 100 internationals for Holland and also in the World Cup final against West Germany four years later. The bloke who plays beside him is also one-paced. He won't give you too much trouble. He was discussing Wim Janssen, who ironically, of course, would become Celtic manager one day. Jock told me, don't worry about him, you won't see him after 20 minutes. He was right, he kept running past me. Even over 50 years later, Celtic fans who remember the occasion still can't quite believe what happened in Milan. But there is no single easy explanation. Multiple factors created the perfect storm at the San Siro, and even if the 4-3-3 formation and lineup from Hamden had been utilised again, the outcome would probably have still been the same, given Celtic's lack of match sharpness and their complacent laid-back approach. Having said that, even a much sharper and better prepared Celtic would probably still have lost with their 4-2-4 against Feyenoord's packed midfield. Everything that possibly could have gone wrong did go wrong before, during and after the final. On their date with destiny, Wim Janssen's Feyenoord faced a Celtic team who lined up Williams, Hay, Gemmell, Murdoch, McNeil, Brogan, Johnston, Wallace, Hughes, Ald, Lennox, Subs, Fallon, Craig, Connolly, Callahan, Hood. It quickly became apparent after the match kicked off that Celtic were not their usual selves. They were second to every ball and being made to look pedestrian by the fast, skillful and surprisingly powerful Dutch team. With their extra man in midfield, they were dominating possession and quickly closing Celtic down when they lost it. Their defence was doubling up on Jimmy Johnston, who was on the receiving end of some overly robust tackling but it was Jim Brogan who would suffer the most, a chipped ankle bone in the first few minutes severely curtailing his effectiveness, although this was not diagnosed until almost a week later. Here again Jock Steen can be criticised for allowing the sweeper to stay on the field. Brogan had been at Celtic since 1964, but had struggled to hold down a first team place until February 1968, when an injury to John Clark gave him his chance and he had never looked back. Jim Brogan understandably did not want to leave the field, especially so early in a European Cup final after missing out in Lisbon three years before, but in difficult enough circumstances, perhaps the manager should have made the decision for him. Certainly the players thought so, Bertie Auld recalling in A Boy Called Bertie. Jim Brogan took an injury early in the first half, and when it was obvious he was not 100%, he should have been taken off. We had Kearney, Jim Craig among the substitutes and he could have come in at right back with Davy Hay moving into Brogan's defensive position alongside Caesar. That might have helped. But Jim, who had of course missed out on a medal in the 1967 European Cup triumph, was desperate to soldier on in the hope that he could be successful this time around. Jock allowed that to happen and that was just one more mistake on a night of many from us, on and off the pitch. The Celtic support, around 25,000 strong in Milan, were so often the 12th man required to lift the team, but that would not happen in the San Siro, as they could barely be heard above the incessant racket of the klaxons every Feyenoord fan seemed to be carrying. Davy Hay remembered in his biography, The Quiet Assassin, written with Alex Gordon, Even our wonderful support seemed to be strangely subdued in the 53,000 crowd. The klaxon horns of the Dutch fans drowned them out and the entire atmosphere appeared to be geared towards Feyenoord. Despite everything, Celtic were robbed of a goal in the 18th minute when Bobby Lennox was wrongly called offside after a drive from Bobby Murdoch was deflected into his path by a Feyenoord defender and the keeper, despite getting a hand to his shot, could not stop it hitting the net. 
Against a run of play, they did take the lead through a typical Tommy Gemmell strike after 32 minutes. Bobby Murdoch took a free kick on the edge of the box and back heeled it into Gemmell's path 25 yards out. The referee, the highly respected Concetto Lobello of Italy, was walking along behind the Feyenoord wall at the time and had to take evasive action as the ball zipped about six inches above the ground and past the unsighted keeper. Gemmell thus became the first British player to score in two European Cup finals, making him a member of a still rather exclusive club and here was a point when the match might, just might have turned. If only Celtic could have held the lead for any length of time, they might have been able to frustrate Feyenoord. But within two minutes, the match was level again, and the Celtic defence looked none too clever in the lead-up. A high ball into the box from a free kick was not dealt with, and after some head tennis in the box, it fell nicely for Feyenoord captain Renus Israel, and his looping header from an unmarked position at the corner of the six-yard box dropped just under the bar at the far post, with Evan Williams, who had already made some outstanding saves, completely stranded. If the half-time whistle offered Celtic some respite from the Dutch onslaught and brought the opportunity for a tactical reshuffle, it was not taken. Several players have made veiled criticisms of Jock Steen at this point. In The Quiet Assassin, Davy Hay writes, we could have gone in at the interval, had a good talk about what was happening out on the park and where we could hopefully put things right. It was still deadlocked at the turnaround and the dressing room was strangely quiet. There were a few in that Celtic team who liked themselves to be heard, but not on this occasion. I still think we believe deep down within ourselves we could beat them. Bertie Ald's recollection of the dressing room at half-time was similar. In A Boy Called Bertie he writes, The half-time talking was strangely muted. Everyone, and I mean everyone, believed we couldn't be as bad in the second half. Tommy Gemmell comes closest to outright criticism of the manager, writing in Lionheart, If you start in second gear, it's hard to get into top gear, and we never really changed up through the gears all night, even though at half-time Jock told us to pick up the game. It was all very well for him to say that, but to pick up the game, you've got to get the ball, and we weren't winning the ball and holding on to it long enough to make passes and bring different players into passing movements. We would no sooner get the ball than we would give it away, and it was hard to get it back off them. It was out of character, because we didn't usually give the ball away lightly. Maybe that had something to do with the team selection. In the second half, Feyenoord's superiority was even more pronounced than it had been in the first, and it was something of a miracle that the match went to extra time, with Evan Williams performing heroics in goal and the woodwork keeping Celtic level. A few minutes before the end, George Connolly was finally introduced, but it was only as a straight swap for Bertie Auld, and the pattern of play remained the same into extra time. Seconds into extra time, John Hughes both made and missed a gilt-edged chance to put Celtic ahead again. Almost straight from Feyenoord's kick-off, he seized on a loose pass in midfield and powered past two defenders into the box. A slightly heavy touch then allowed the keeper, Eddie Peters Grafland, to close him down and Hughes' shot hit his legs before bouncing towards goal. But unfortunately, both defenders had by then got back to cover although one of them almost put it into his own net before the keeper pounced to grab it on the goal line. As we'll discuss in episode 2 of this series, Hughes and others in the team believed that this costly miss led to his premature exit from the club 18 months later. It would be harsh to be too critical of the player though, because he was one of Celtic's better performers on the night, and such was the paucity of their overall play, singling one player out for blame would be ridiculously unfair. Half an hour after Hughes' chance, Celtic were hanging on grimly and came agonisingly close to taking the final to a replay, which would have been played at the same venue two days later. With almost the last action of the game, Feyenoord scored the goal that won them the European Cup and no one could possibly dispute it was anything other than totally deserved. Infuriatingly though, it was a goal that could so easily have been prevented, as both Davy Hay and Bertie Auld relate in their biographies, although both are slightly inaccurate in their recollections. Bobby Murdoch won the ball in the centre circle in Celtic's half of the field, and the referee awarded a free kick when his immediate opponent appealed for a handball. 
It certainly didn't look like a handball, but as the referee's whistle blew, Murdoch made little in the way of protest. Hay describes it in The Quiet Assassin. Murdy picked up the ball as soon as Lobello whistled for the foul and handed it to an opponent. In A Boy Called Bertie, Ald remembered, The clock was ticking down and we were three minutes from that second chance when a strange thing happened, but it showed what a true sportsman Chopper Murdoch was. The Dutch were awarded a free kick about 15 yards into our half, just inside the right touch line, and our superb midfielder actually handed the ball to his opponent. Can you imagine that happening today? Looking back, Chopper should have feigned he didn't hear the official whistle and booted it into the stand. Or just let it run on. Both their recollections are basically sound, but the free kick was taken from the centre circle and Murdoch didn't hand the ball to anyone. He threw it, not to the free kick taker, but to the referee. As the ball trundled towards him, Lobello passed it first time to a waiting Feyenoord player who, as both Ald and Hay describe, instantly lobbed the ball into the penalty box with Celtic players still trotting back into position and caught totally unawares. Billy McNeil, like everyone else, was caught on the hop and was unable to head it. In desperation he threw up his hands and as he fell to the ground succeeded only in knocking the ball into the path of Ove Kinval who had gambled on the ball going over the Celtic captain. From a tight angle he lobbed it over Williams and Celtic's dream of a second European Cup was over. Evan Williams told Graham McCall for the official biography of Celtic, published in 2008, I just missed getting to it and no more. I think with Billy handling it, it slowed the pace of the ball down. If you look at it, it may have been going out for a goal kick. Kinval just got his toe to the ball and towed it over the top of me. I stopped for the split second before he scored because I thought the referee was going to give a penalty. Then I realised that the whistle had not gone and that he was playing the advantage. Photographs of the Celtic players on the pitch after the match show them looking utterly devastated. This is entirely understandable, but the devastation wreaked on the club that night was more damaging than anyone could have imagined. Celtic lost more than just a football match and a European Cup. Something deep inside Jockstein's Celtic was broken that night and it was probably never repaired. Billy McNeil writes in Hail Caesar, the defeat in Milan hit us all very hard. It was the nearest we ever came to falling out with one another and it took months to recover from the disappointment. The players were bitterly disappointed with themselves, but they were also unhappy with the post-match comments made by Jock Steen, which they felt were designed to shift the blame onto them. Steen was quoted in the Glasgow Herald of the 7th of May, 1970. The better team won, we had too many players off form. I know the reason, but I am not going to criticise my players in public. We are disappointed. I was surprised we played so badly, but I don't want to take away any credit from the other side. Every one of their team was a good player. More damningly, Alan Heron wrote in the Sunday Mail of the 10th of May, 1970. Steen told me he wasn't as disappointed as he might have been. If we had played well and lost to a poor goal, then I would have been disappointed. But we didn't play well. Only 30% of the team showed up at all, and you cannot hope to win a European Cup final with this percentage. The Celtic manager was, however, a bit shaken that his players could play so badly on such an important occasion, and told me, I don't feel sorry for the players. They could do something about it. They could do something with their heads and their feet. I felt sorry for our fans who had spent so much money and travelled so far to shout us on. They are the ones I feel sorry for. They deserve better than this. The inference from Steen's statements is clearly that the players were at fault and one of the most damaging consequences of defeat in Milan was its detrimental effect on the relationship between manager and players. It would be wrong to say that Steen was loved by all his players. You don't get to be a great manager without upsetting at least some of your squad. Several Celtic players of the era have since been very critical of Steen and what they perceive as their unfair treatment at his hands. This was one occasion when virtually all of them felt this way, 
But maybe more importantly, the aura of infallibility that had surrounded Steen since taking up his post and the awe in which he was held by them had been shattered by how wrong he had been in his dismissive assessment of the threat posed by Feyenoord. Jim Craig told David Potter and Tom Campbell for Jock Steen the Celtic years, For the first five years at Celtic Park, Jock Steen was a genius. After that, it may have been a different story. The faith of the players in their manager was badly dented by Milan, and before the month was out, their relationship was further strained by the debacle that was the summer tour of North America. After Milan, the last thing a demoralised group of players wanted to do was fly to Canada and the United States for three more weeks of football with long journeys between matches and long evenings at supporters' functions. Their mood wasn't helped when Jimmy Johnston was excused due to his fear of flying, which understandably caused a great deal of resentment, and it was a disaster from start to finish. The first match, against Manchester United in Toronto, was part of a round-robin tournament also involving Italian club Barry. Manchester United had already beaten Barry before Celtic arrived in Canada, and the match kicked off just hours after Celtic finally reached Toronto. United's 2-0 victory meant that they had secured the trophy before Celtic played Barry in their second match. Jim Craig doubled as the Evening Times' special correspondent on the trip, telephoning reports every day to their office. On the 12th of May 1970, he reported, Now we're off to New York where we meet Barry tomorrow night. I think the boys will be better rested for this one. After all, we were 20 hours travelling from Scotland to here, and the four hours delay didn't help. The match against Barry in New York on the 13th of May 1970 was not part of the Toronto Cup. Supposedly a friendly, someone forgot to tell the Italians, and a bad-tempered match ended in a 1-1 draw after Barry took the lead with the softest of penalties, with Harry Hood scoring the equaliser. Jim Craig's report in the Evening Times of the 14th of May read, Not for the first time in matches with Continental clubs, some of our players were spat on, but that's show business. Jock Steen had warned his players to keep their cool in the face of what he expected to be underhand tactics. But unfortunately, Celtic then had to play them again in their now irrelevant Toronto Cup match on the 17th of May, put back 24 hours from its original date because of a severe thunderstorm. This time, tensions boiled over. The Evening Times reported on the 18th of May 1970, This was the third game in Celtic's ill-fated tour of North America, and they are still looking for a win. However, after last night's football farce, Celtic were quite happy to settle for a 2-2 draw, and their lives. All the trouble started after Lennox was pulled down by Losetto in the first half, and the CNE Stadium suddenly became a boxing booth, with fists flying in all directions. Celtic took the lead through Lou Macari on 27 minutes, and should have been out of sight by half-time but some inspired goalkeeping prevented more goals and a defensive mix-up allowed Barry to equalise. In the second half, Barry took the lead, but Vic Davidson pulled Celtic level again before the match finally descended into farce. The Evening Times reported, With only a quarter of an hour left, goalkeeper Spallazzi was ordered off after a rather innocuous-looking clash with Macari. The Italians in the 3,000 crowd were now streaming for blood, after the Italians had finally accepted this debatable decision, Lossetto took a kick at Macari three minutes later and was promptly sent off. With only five minutes left, the bubble burst. Jim Craig, who turned in yet another five-star display, was tripped inside the area and to the astonishment of everyone, a penalty was actually given. Barry captain Muccini mustered his men and they walked to the pavilion. Then the referee and linesman walked off. The bewildered Celtic players followed suit. But there was more to come. Just as the crowd were dispersing, the Barry players came back onto the field. So did Celtic, but the referee remained in his room and the game was abandoned. This photograph of the Celtic players on the field at the end of the game speaks volumes. The haunted looks on their faces betraying the trauma they were going through as the tour went from bad to worse. By this point, they had probably just become aware that, incredibly, Jock Steen had, without warning, 
left the stadium and flown home in the middle of the second half. Tom Campbell and David Potter write in Jockstein, the Celtic years, 15 minutes from the end of a farcical match against Barry in Toronto's Exhibition Stadium, during which the Italians staged a walkout after a second of their players had been sent off, he turned abruptly to Sean Fallon, I'm away home. His assistant stared at him in some disbelief, as Steen, who had been notably short-tempered in the pre-match warm-up, continued by pointing to Bertie Auld and Tommy Gemmell, who had been involved the day before in a misunderstanding at a supporters' function, and see that those two don't play again on this tour. Given the circumstances, it was probably inevitable that there would be some kind of breakdown in discipline, and a few days later, after walking out of yet another supporters' function, in Gemmell's own words in Lionheart to have a couple of beers and do a bit of sniffing after birds if there were any around, Sean Fallon, who had been left holding the baby by Steen, felt he had no option but to send them both home, and suddenly the whole world was aware that there was something seriously wrong. The Scotsman reported on the 19th of May, 1970, Celtic's wonderful world has collapsed since losing the European Cup final to Feyenoord in Milan two weeks ago. They have been dogged by bad luck. Delays, breakdowns, a postponed match, an abandoned match, and a repeat of a transfer request by Gemmell. To crown it all, Jock Steen, on his return to Scotland from Toronto yesterday, walked to a waiting car, only to find it had a puncture. Celtic's world had been punctured. And amid rumours that he was about to be appointed Manchester United manager, Steen's explanation for his sudden return was unconvincing. He claimed that the chronic ankle injury that ended his playing career had flared up again and required specialist treatment. But the Evening Times of the 18th of May 1970 reported, There was, however, no sign of the injury as the Celtic boss strode briskly across the tarmac from the BOAC jet, shrugging off questions about the Celtic problems during the past few days. More seriously, Steen explained that he needed to be back in Glasgow because Jimmy Johnston had out of nowhere demanded a transfer. Over the next few days, contradictory stories appeared in the papers. The Evening Times reported on the 19th of May 1970. Celtic boss Jock Steen had no comment to make today on the rumours flying about down south that Jimmy Johnston, the Parkhead Club's international right winger, was set to move in a sensational £200,000 transfer deal. This comes hard on the heels of Tommy Gemmell's repeated transfer request and, of course, Celtic's European Cup final defeat in Milan to say nothing of their ill-fated tour of North America. However, while Mr Steen was keeping quiet, the wee man had this to say from his Uddingston home on the rumoured deal. I'm not interested. I'm quite happy where I am. But by the following day, the same paper was writing. Celtic Football Club and Jimmy Johnston, their international outside right, appear to have reached a stalemate because of the player's ultimatum for a new deal at Parkhead. Johnston, who is 25, said yesterday he wasn't interested in a move after being told of a report that he was about to move south in a £200,000 transfer deal. But last night, his loyalty deserted him and he stated quite categorically, if I don't get a new contract from the club, I won't play for them again. Celtic manager Jock Steen, on the other hand, isn't budging. Johnston presented me with an ultimatum before we left on our tour a fortnight ago. He made financial requests which the club considered unreasonable. Mr Steen then went on to point out, Johnston has completed only two years of a 12-year contract he signed with Celtic in 1968. The next move is up to the player. The contract Johnston signed was for six years with a six-year option and is said to be worth £100,000. The wee winger has made the request for personal and financial reasons. Celtic went so far as to send a letter to every club in the English First Division, notifying them of the availability of both Johnston and Gemmell. But with most of the bigger clubs out of the country on tours, the only solid interest came from Derby County manager Brian Clough, who was quoted in the Daily Mirror of the 22nd of May 1970. I would be failing in my job if I did not take notice when world-class players become available. 
The chances are that the price will end my interest in either player or both, but how do I know I cannot afford them if I don't ask the price? However, by the time the Mirror printed this story, it was already old news. Perhaps indicating he wasn't exactly set on selling his unsettled stars, Jock Steen had refused to put a price on either player, telling Clough to put an offer in writing and it would be considered. Clough was quoted in the Evening Times of the 21st of May, 1970. Some clubs put a figure on players when they are put up for sale, but Mr Steen gave no set price. It was more than curiosity, but it is far too early to presume that a bid will follow. The Johnston transfer saga was settled as quickly as it flared, the talismanic winger withdrawing the request after a series of meetings with Steen. The Glasgow Herald of the 27th of May 1970 reported, Celtic's sudden spate of trouble ebbed considerably when Jimmy Johnston withdrew his ultimatum concerning a wage increase. After a private meeting with the player at Parkhead, Mr Jock Steen, the team manager, stated, Jimmy Johnston has resolved his differences with the club and he will resume training with the rest of the players on July 15th. Neither Mr Steen nor the player would elaborate on the discussion. The rift between Celtic and Tommy Gemmell, however, shows no sign of being repaired, but neither has there been a transfer offer for the player. Tommy Gemmell had been on the transfer list since October 1969, although Jock Steen always insisted no offers had been received for his services. It followed the infamous incident between Gemmell and Helmut Haller during Scotland's World Cup qualifying tie in Hamburg on the 22nd of October. Jimmy Johnston had opened the scoring for Scotland after only three minutes and an Alan Gilzean goal made the score 2-2 on 63 minutes but West Germany had gone ahead again 10 minutes from time. As Scotland desperately searched for another equaliser in the closing minutes, Haller cynically caught Gemmell from behind as the fullback prepared to unleash a shot from distance. An enraged Gemmell turned and ran at Haller, who comically turned tail and fled with the defender in hot pursuit. As he caught up with the German midfielder, Gemmell lashed out, Haller leaping into the air in alarm as Gemmell's boot caught him on the backside. Milking it to the full, Haller writhed on the ground in apparent agony, while the referee inevitably ordered Gemmell from the field. Jock Steen was in attendance at the match, and after the Scotland party landed at Presswick Airport, drove Gemmell, Johnston and Billy McNeil to the Marine Hotel in Troon, where Celtic were preparing for that weekend's League Cup final against St Johnston. Gemmell remembers in Lionheart that Steen said not a word to him about the incident, either after the match or on the drive to Troon. But he writes, That dismissal in Hamburg was to become a watershed in my Celtic career, even though it had been sustained while wearing the dark blue of Scotland. Gemmell loved to hang around outside the stadium on match days, soaking up the atmosphere until the last possible moment before going into the dressing room. The day of the League Cup final, 25th of October 1969, was no different. But this time, Gemmell was taken completely unawares when he arrived. Davy Hay was pulling on the number three shorts rather than the usual number two, and this was Gemmell's first inkling that he had been dropped. Steen did not acknowledge him, and Jim Kennedy then handed him a stand ticket and he left the dressing room, wishing Hay good luck. A mortified Gemmell demanded a meeting with Jock Steen the following morning and was unconvinced by his explanation that Chairman Robert Kelly wanted him dropped as a disciplinary action for being sent off while playing for Scotland. He told Steen he would not have been dropped if the final had been against Rangers rather than St Johnston, but Steen insisted he still would have been. Again, a claim Gemmell found unconvincing. Gemmell writes in Lionheart, He had never dropped me before, but that was not the way to do it for the first time. A manager, I believe, should tell players they are not playing in advance of the match and tell them why. So I told Jock that he had not given me a satisfactory answer about why I had been dropped and why he had humiliated me in the dressing room and I asked him to put me on the transfer list. It was not a snap decision. I had thought about it long and hard overnight and had decided to make that request unless Jock came up with a reasonable explanation for what he had done. If he had given me a valid reason, I could have accepted it. What upset me was not being dropped, but the way it was done. 
After that episode, I still respected Jock Steen 100% as a manager, but I had lost a lot of respect for him as a person. For seven months then, Gemmell had been on the transfer list, but his relationship with Steen was further strained by the manager's denial that any interest had been expressed by other clubs, despite Gemmell being informed by intermediaries that Leicester City, and intriguingly Barcelona, wanted to sign him. In those far-off days before Bosman and freedom of contract, Gemmell could not outright tell Steen he knew of their interest because this would make him complicit in tapping and amount to breach of contract, so he had no choice but to accept Steen's word. On his early return from North America, there was no row with Steen and no big showdown. In Lionheart, Gemmell remembers Steen actually being very understanding when he and Ald met with him. He writes, Jock gave us a hundred lines and told us not to do it again, but there were no fines or suspensions. The story ran and ran because a reporter, John Mackenzie of the Scottish Daily Express, made a song and dance and got headlines out of it for about three days, but there was nothing to it. Jock simply said, learn from it and don't let it happen again. It's now over and done with and you've been punished enough through being sent home. As soon as he saw us face to face, that was the end of the matter. The month of May 1970 would not end with the departures of Jimmy Johnston or Tommy Gemmell. But the damage inflicted on Celtic was catastrophic. Where before Jock Steen was master of all he surveyed and enjoyed an almost godlike status with both players and fans, his aura of infallibility had been shattered. Where before any discontent within the squad had been limited to a few players and was containable, now he had an entire squad who felt he had publicly sought to place the blame on them for the Feyenoord debacle. Where before both players and fans had felt almost invincible, their self-confidence had suffered a shattering blow in Milan. It's very far from a disgrace to lose a European Cup final, but everyone connected with the club knew that they had in large part brought about their own downfall. They had fallen for their own publicity, totally dismissed the very real threat posed by Feyenoord and failed to prepare adequately. In the circumstances, the events of the North American tour were an accident waiting to happen. While Jock Steen can be criticised for what amounted to hubris at the club in the build-up to the European Cup final, he also deserves praise for the way he held the club together in the weeks and months after the events of May 1970. Despite continuing problems, he would take Celtic to another two European Cup semi-finals in the following four seasons and either one of them could easily have turned out differently. In only one of those four matches were goals conceded, but tellingly, no goals were scored at all, and two players in particular who were moved on too soon in late 1971 might well have made all the difference. 